Happy Wednesday, friend. It is so good to see you. I'm really excited for our coffee session this week because, man, oh, man, I, I'm excited about it and it's going to be really helpful for me. <laughs> so selfishly, I hope it is really helpful for you as well. If you're new here, welcome. We meet here every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern with something spicy fun in our cups. Today, I'm coming in from Austin, Texas with some green tea. I went first, so you didn't have to. But if you haven't already, say hi in the chat. That is where the party is at. Again, we are all sitting at this cozy coffee shop together, which means you are not getting wisdom from just me and Jan. You are getting it from Giacomo and Sean and Rachel and Kelly and Shelby and Jeff and everybody who's rocking out and hanging out in the chat room. We are all in this together, learning and growing and getting better with one another. As I said before, I'm really excited about today's coffee session because I know just for me personally, I have really been focused in 2023 on my leadership skills and really building up that sort of resilience muscle, that kind of uncomfortable growth muscle that you have to expand and dig into when you want to develop as a leader. And so as I was thinking about this subject and kind of honing in on a little bit more, started to talk to other people about it. People are like, yeah, but Kim, how do we grow this muscle? Like, how do we think about building our resilience and really stepping into leadership roles in a meaningful way. And so when I stumbled on the work of Jan Rutherford, I was like, oh, like the skies opened up. I was like, this is how, this is how we do it. Uh, because Jan is a former Green Beret, which if you are not from the United States, just know it's, it's a pretty high position in our military over here. He is the founder of Self-Reliant Leadership, which is an executive coaching group. He's also a keynote speaker speaking on resilient leadership. And he also hosts, which I thought was really cool, these wilderness expeditions called Crucible Weekends, where he takes leaders and former military special veterans and takes them out uh, to do these really hard physical exercises and trips, which I was just like, okay, maybe one day until then my vacations are going to be spent on the beach, but I like it. I like the idea of really using time off to build yourself. He's also a fellow LinkedIn learning instructor and co-host of the leadership podcast. And a little birdie told me that he has a book coming out next summer. So we're going to get the full scoop on that before, before the rest of the world gets it. And so please help me welcome, say a big hi to Ellen and um, Kelly and Giacomo and everybody. Help me by raising your cups and inviting Jan to coffee with us. Hey, Kim. How's Thank it going? For, thanks for having me. Um, I've been doing a podcast for seven years and I can tell you, you are a pro. That was a, oh. a great introduction. Thank you for having me on your show. I've already learned a ton of things I need to, to do better at. So it's really nice to be here. And I've got my, my Bewley's tea from Ireland. I love it. Well, we are so excited to, to have you here. And I feel like I have a zillion questions to, to talk to you about. But kind of first and foremost, I really feel like you are one of the few people that I've heard kind of in the space of leadership that has used the term self-reliant. Most of the time we hear about leadership um, in, in more of a, how do I lean in or, you know, be more aggressive, but, but self-reliant, I feel like is a very unique term. And I'm wondering how you came about defining your work by this term or, or what does it mean to you? Yeah. So it, it came to me in, through my experience in the military, Imagine, if you will, and again, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're here and, and honored um, and from all over the place. And I'm here in sunny Colorado. Um, but imagine, if you will, you're, you're on an expedition climbing up a mountain, you know, and, and let's pretend there's no snow. It's nice and warm and flowers and it's, it's beautiful. Um, you know, you're, you're with a team and everybody's counting on you to have been prepared physically, mentally, emotionally that, you know, you're carrying all your stuff, the, your water, everything you're going to need. And 
you know, everybody's counting on you to be squared away. Well, that's, that's the absolute bare minimum is to be squared away, self-reliant. Because when you're self-reliant as a leader, then you can focus your attention on helping others. Because maybe not everybody else is going to be able to carry all their weight or that they prepared. And the same thing goes on in the business world. You know, we have a goal. We have a pace that we need to go at. Not everybody can go 90 miles an hour every single day. Not everybody can carry the same amount of water every single day. But as a leader, we raised our hand and said, hey, I'll take on this responsibility. I will make more sacrifices than other people. I will exhibit more discipline to be squared away, you know, mentally, emotionally, and physically. I, I owe that to my team. I get to serve other people. Well, and I'm glad you brought up this concept around sacrifice as a leader, because I was listening to a podcast, um, our mutual friend Kwame's podcast that you were on and just like, allow me to geek out for a second. You, yep. you know, I feel like when we've heard about sacrifice as a leader, at least for me, I'm like, yeah, you know, you stay later or you come in earlier, you work harder, you like push, push, push. And you said something that really, like I had an aha moment. I had like an Oprah moment. Jan was my like Oprah for this yeah. moment because you you told this story on this podcast and I'll fill everybody in if they didn't listen to the podcast. You, you told a story about um, a group of individuals. I think they were maybe in the military who were building a bridge um, across this little river. Yeah. And as the, as the leader, the leader's like, you know, I want my people to know that I'm in the trenches with them and I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're mono e mono, like I'm in there with you. I'm not above you in any way. And long story short, they, they built the bridge in the wrong place. And yeah. by the time the leader actually got up on the hill and, and looked, it was like, rut row. Yeah. Uh, we, we built the bridge in the wrong place be because I wasn't up on the hill really helping navigate and say, actually, it's supposed to be like, you know, 30 feet to the left. And you said, which really opened my eyes, that sometimes being a leader is sacrificing your, your ability to be liked and, and to feel like you're kind of in there with everybody because you have to remove yourself. And I just wanted to say like, wow, can you expand on yeah. that or, or just speak yeah. to that a little more? Because well, that was such an aha moment for me. You, you recited the story perfectly. Um, it, it literally is about setting your pride and ego aside. And it's not about you. And, you know, as much as you want to prove to everybody, hey, I can get in the in the dirt and and I can do do the work. What, what they want you to do is do the right thing. You, you know, that's what they want. And as an executive coach, I spend so much time in two areas. One is helping people manage their time better and be focused. And, and a lot of that literally is self-discipline. And the other one is, um, you know, developing people, coaching them, encouraging them, having difficult conversations. But that, you know, that part about um, that, that discipline about time management is you, you've got to role model what you expect from other people. And I can't tell you how many times in the last six months I've said to people, hey, um, describe somebody you want to, you know, that you would have confidence in following. And the person will say, well, they're calm, cool, collected. I, I know everything's going to be OK. And then I'll say, OK, let's look in the mirror. What do you see? And they'll say, my hair is on fire. I'm like, well, and then I say, ask yourself, am I easy to follow? Because nobody wants to follow somebody that's absolutely frenetic. We are all having difficult times at home, at work. I mean, things are difficult. I mean, that's the thing that we all share at this moment. We, we all have our crosses to bear. There's, there's difficulties. Um, you know, the last thing that we need is somebody that's just absolutely frenetic um, and that doesn't give us hope and positivity and optimism that things are going to get better. We've got to take a step back and basically say, where, where's the right place for the bridge before we just go crazy with exerting energy and, and um, you know, wasted energy, if you will. 
And I love this point about really asking ourselves, you know, are we someone who we would want to follow? If if we kind of look in the mirror and answer that question as like a, well, not so much, like that's a no. Yeah. Um, what are one or two things, Jan, that we could sort of instantly implement or like one or two things that we we've we've recognized that there's a problem we're we're not the one that we would follow into the darkness what's one or two things we can do to improve that well i'll I'll give you three but i want to start off by saying you know giving you a big picture one and and that is i think all of us have a personal responsibility no matter what we're doing to find purpose and meaning in our work um, mm-hmm. if we, if we can't find purpose and meaning, we're missing the most important ingredient, which is passion. And, and we've all realized over the last three years, life's too short. Um, too short. and, and it, it does not matter what you do. I think you can find purpose and meaning because work is about serving others. And it's not just about trading time for money. And an older generation could blame a, ju- a young generation and say, you know, blame it on that. I put the responsibility on leaders to create an environment where people can find purpose and meaning. It doesn't matter if they're making rubber hoses or, you know, they're building lawnmowers. I mean, it it doesn't matter. Um, The work that we do is helping others in some way, shape or form. And I think we've got to figure that out. And and again, that's that's why I believe we're here is to serve. But the the three things I would put out there is, again, you know, from a mental, emotional and physical perspective, you know, being squared away mentally, you know, means that you have that passion, you have that curiosity, that you're always focused on in continuous improvement. You're trying to figure out ways to get better at whatever it is you do, soft skills, hard skills. The second is being squared away emotionally, which is hard these days. And I think a lot of that comes down to self-awareness. We all think we're self-aware. We all think we're good drivers. You know, as far as driving, we're average. Most of us are average. That's average. Self-awareness, most of us are not as self-aware as we could be. And, and the hard thing is to, to ask people for advice and suggestions and, and even feedback. Um, and, and again, to have the relationships where people feel comfortable giving us, you know, that counsel. And the third thing is, and, and I remember this as a CEO, I thought, I don't know how you could be a CEO if you're not physically fit. I don't, I don't know how you could have the stamina because at the end of the day, you're physically and emotionally and mentally absolutely drained. So, you know, I think you owe it to your colleagues. I think you owe it to your family to um, create white space in your calendar for wellness, whatever that might be for you. I love this idea of really creating this white space. I think for somebody like me, perhaps that's a little bit of a busy bee, um, white space feels unproductive. So we just want to fill it. And I know that that's something that you also talk a lot about that you do not get paid to be busy. You get paid for results. And so I'm curious, this point that Jeff is making about um, a leader who's who's either shifting culture or maybe joining a new team with a new culture, or maybe they're battling remote work <laughs> uh, where the culture is not great at all, or, or you're home yeah. alone. How can you continue to, I guess, build that leadership muscle? Yeah, you, you know, it's it's a great question, and Jeff, I appreciate it, and. Um... I was with a team earlier this week and the the question I was getting, it was almost like, um, I feel like if I ask people to work, I need to apologize (laughs) because they joined this company for all this kumbaya stuff. And now things are hard in the market and we're not going to outsmart our competitors. That's not going to happen. We're going to have to outwork them. I'm going to have to ask my people to work really hard and to have activity. And you know, so when we say culture, I, I, that's such a, a hard word because there's so many no. definitions. I like to think of it as, you know, what's the environment in which I work? And I think at the highest level, a leader creates an environment, designs an environment where they get the best behaviors from everybody. And by best behaviors, I mean, you get stuff done, you produce and you're efficient 
and it's the golden rule. You, you treat each other you, as you'd like to be treated and you don't forget at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, who are we doing this for? You know, there's a customer. So Jeff, what, where I would go back to as far as culture or team it is all about three things. One, do people absolutely understand the expectation? You know, both how you, the behaviors that are aligned with the core values and what they need to produce. Do they know where they stand with you? You know, hey, great job. Hey, here's some things we're working on. And are there consequences for performance? Um, are there rewards, recognition, awards, out of boys, out of girls, whatever it is? Are we catching people doing things right? And if not, you know, are we starting this way, you know, figuratively, not literally anymore, but figuratively with our arm around somebody and saying, hey, um, you know, you said you're going to do this. You let me down. You let yourself down. You let the, I mean, you don't have to put someone on a PIP, a performance improvement plan right away. But literally, you know, being honest and compassionate and, and candid about people's performance is what they expect. And those, that's hard. So expectations clear, where they stand clear. And, and, and there are other consequences for great performance, mediocre performance, or poor performance. Because again, going back to the climbing, if somebody's carrying 20 gallons of water and somebody's carrying one gallon of water, that's not fair. That's not fair to the team. And, and once in a while, it's okay. We all have bad days, but it can't be routine that you know somebody's always getting up there going, hey, I didn't pack any food, I didn't pack any water, I don't have a jacket. You know, That's not being very self-reliant. It's not being self-reliant. And I also have this, this sort of love-hate relationship when, when we start to talk about other people and culture, because as we know, like it's nothing we can control. I mean, I have a little Harry Potter wand here. Sometimes mm -hmm. I wish I could wave it around and control people, but I, I cannot. The only thing I can control is myself. And I feel like my question is, is sort of symbiotic with, with Kelly's, which is if the only thing that we can control is ourselves. We, we can't control other people. You know, we are, we are a party of one coming into this. Yeah. You've worked with thousands of, you know, some of the top leaders in the country. What are one or two things that you really feel like you tell a lot of people to avoid? Like just do not pass go, whatever you do, like don't, like try to avoid these kind of stumbling areas for for leaders well I, I it's a great question it's a hard question but i if i had to nail it down to one i would say you're addicted to busy you, you are addicted to busy um and and you know on the crucible expeditions we run we do a, a solo challenge where we put people out by themselves with a journal for three hours go go be by yourself for three hours for some people that's really hard to be, you know, alone in their thoughts. And they, the, you know, a lot of them come back with epiphanies or they'll come back and say, I can't believe I don't give myself time. I mean, even 15 minutes, I don't give myself time to rest, recharge, refocus, re-energize, whatever it might be. And so, you know, as much as we'll, we'll be, you know, things in our calendar will be sacred because we've made commitments to other people. What about the commitment to you? Um, if, again, if you're not squared away, you're not going to be able to help anybody. And, you know, part of it is making sure you get things right in your life, in their life. You know, you put the bridge in the right spot. And, and sometimes you've got to take a, a step back from that. And so it, to me, the big challenge in the business world, if you're leading people, is how often do I get up on the hill and look and figure out, hey, are we doing the right stuff? And how often do I get down in the trenches one-on-one -on -one and developing my people. Because if I don't develop my people, I can't delegate to go sit on the hill. And so that's the dilemma is um, they don't delegate because they haven't developed their people or they don't trust themselves or their people. So trust is underlying all that, the trust in themselves first. And it's a good sort of baby step for that, maybe just blocking like, I, I don't want to say like, oh, a whole day because people are like, ah, overwhelmed. But is it maybe just like an hour a week? Or like, how do you, for leaders that might be addicted to busy, you know, yeah. what is a good sort of baby step to, to start to break that habit well, a little bit? Well, the hard part is 
I remember as a CEO, I felt like I had the least amount of control I've ever had in my life over my time or anything. So, you know, as, as you move up, it gets more challenging. And so if you can't set boundaries when you're early in your career, you're never going to be able to set them. You, you know, ideally for me, and, I, and I'm not perfect at this, but I really try, really try to only book four hours a day um, mm. with, with other people. Yep. Most of the time I don't hit that. But if, if I've got, if I'm only booking four hours, I've got plenty of white space to, to, you know, because every meeting I have, I need to prep for and I need to follow up. And then there might be a workshop in a week that I need to spend time on, or like you said, you know, a book. So if I'm not creating that white space, and, and again, I'm not any different as an entrepreneur than anybody else, you know, that's working for a small, medium or large company. We have two things we control, our time and how we respond to other people. That's it. That's all we control. You know, control your time, go sit up on the hill, go in the trenches. How do you want to interact with your people that's going to produce the result you seek? And, and again, I feel like that four hours is such a good thing for us to try. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That is so, that's so good. And I also feel like just giving us that space gives us the ability to look back and hopefully our bridge is in the right place. Yeah. 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 But I also feel like when, when you get that opportunity to kind of sit, sit and look back on what you're doing, I mean, hindsight's always 2020, right? And so I love this point that Hudson brings up, which is for you, Dan, you know, having the hindsight to be 2020 to look back what are some sort of lessons on resilience or, or something that you learned that maybe some of us who have yet to walk into the great success that you found should, should try or to avoid or learn ourselves through you? Yeah, Hudson, I love that question. And, you know, the thing <laughs> that, that I learned the really hard way was I could be right, but I was wrong. In other words, um, I had a, a boss one time say to me, Jan, do you know who Don Quixote is? I'm like, he goes, you're chasing windmills. This thing you're trying to get, a, you know, is never going to happen. Stop it. You know, you've lost credibility with the boss. And I, I think, you know, part of resilience is this per persistence, determination, passion, grit. And part of it is having the wisdom and the judgment to know what are the right things to push on and what are the things, you know, even if you, you know, you're right, Hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put in any political chits here because I'm not going to get them back. Um, you know, you've only got so many arrows in your quiver and that's one of the hard things to learn. And, and we all learn the hard way is, you know, because if, you know, as Jeff Pfeffer from Stanford says, Hey, job one is keep your job. You know, if you don't have a job, you can't take care of the customers. You can't take care of your people. You might not be able to take care of your family. So it, you've got to decide, you know, hey, is this is this something that, you know, defies my moral compass or is this hey, you know, take the good with the bad. There's no such thing as a perfect culture. There's no such thing as a perfect boss. Um, you know, you make do. I, I, I don't know. Is, is that resonate with you, Kim? It totally resonates with me because I think sometimes we as humans are, are kind of always built to find like, what's better? What's better? What's, you know, how do I get even further? And I think that sometimes you're absolutely right. If, if you're always looking for the perfect boss, good luck be, yeah. because you're going to end up jumping from, from one job for another until you're, you know, 95 years old. So I think sometimes while it's such a great, quality for us to have to kind of always be looking for bigger and better at some point you just sort of have to look within yourself which goes back to your self-reliant leadership and say you know I'm I'm in a spot where I'm 85 percent happy and great and I have to make up the next 15 percent like that's yeah. on me I can't yeah. look for like outside sources to do that yeah yeah it's always to me you know people I, it, it always happens. I mean, we get to a point at, at, with our jobs and our careers and our companies where we just say, hey, is this worth it? And it happens on our bad days. It happens sometimes on our good days. And I always say, hey, we always have three choices because we're all volunteers. You know, yeah. we, we are volunteers. You, you know, you don't have none of us have to work at the company we're at. 
So the three choices we always have is suck it up, you know, <laughs> deal with it, try to change it. You know, what are all the ways that you can change things, you know, through influence, alliances, making a business case. And again, most people I see trying to change things never even show any numbers. They just try to talk. It's like, you know, sh show the boss the numbers, you know, figure that out. What's what's the value? And, and the third thing, if you can't change it, um, you have to decide, OK, I, I'll deal with it or, hey, this you know, my values are no longer aligned here. This doesn't work for me. And then, then choose to leave. Um, we, we always have those three choices. And I, I encourage the people I'm working with, hey, you know, part of leading is getting people to do things they otherwise wouldn't. And that's not just the people that report to you. That's your peers and colleagues. And that's your, your boss or bosses. And that's where executives really struggle. I mean, most people get to the point where like, I'm, I'm really good with my team. My team loves me. And then they realize, I don't really have any friends around me. I don't have support. You know, the boss is coming down on me they, because they haven't nurtured that relationship. And um, that's tough. That's tough. And those are some great sort of quick questions that we can, I think, regularly ask ourselves to, to check in, yeah. which I think is important. Yeah. Well, I think, I think sometimes we, we do the work. I joke around like January one, yeah. <laughs> everyone likes to do the work, you know, we're starting off the year we're we're doing the work, but I always, I actually like to kind of refresh every quarter which yep. is why, you know, I'm saying like, okay, the top of 2023, I said I wanted to work on my leadership. Okay. I want to sit down with Jan and like have a little check-in. It's now April, like still a little Q1 temperature check. How are we doing with that? Because I think sometimes people are like a set it and forget it. And we have to kind of continue to ask ourselves these questions over and over again throughout the year. Well, you know, I, uh, this is not my original thoughts. It comes from AJ, AJ Laffley, who is a former CEO of Procter & Gamble. He wrote an article in HBR about the four things only a CEO can do. And I think it's helpful for all of us to remember what those are, because I think it also applies to us. And we need to know that the person at the top of the organization is thinking about these four things. Um, hey, interpret the meaningful outside. You know, hey, what's going on in the market? What's going on outside here with customers and in our industry? To what business are we in and not in? We can't be all things to all people. We've got to be focused. The third is, you know, balance short-term yield and long-term investment. Um, just like our family budget, we can't have everything we want. Um, we don't have unlimited resources. And the fourth thing is what we've been talking about is uphold the values and standards. Um, look at the professional sports teams. I mean, you have to make the roster. You know, every year you got to make the roster you know, it's not said at work in the business world, but every, every day we got to make the roster because there's people coming on that are, maybe they want to work harder. Maybe they want to work smarter. Maybe they are smarter. Um, we've got to prove our, our, our value. And, and we've got to figure out a way to market that value with it that doesn't, you know, compromise, you know, and feel like, you know, we're sucking up, but I don't know about you, about you, Kim, but the people I've seen that lose their jobs, are the people that failed to demonstrate their value to the organization. They didn't lose their job because they were bad people, that they didn't produce results. They were not good at helping others understand their value. And that's not something that we, you know, there's no workshops on that. There's no <laughs> MBA on, on, you know, that, but we've got to pay attention to it. No, it's that, that's one that I wish there was classes on it. <laughs> I wish you could get an instant download, but, but you can't, but that's why you're here. And that's why we're here to kind of learn, learn these lessons together. So I'm excited to dig into these, these speed round questions with you, Jan, because I feel like you're going to offer a lot of tactical advice, which I'm eager to get my hands on. All right. Yeah. It's fire away. Okay, what is the best work-related thing that you have started using or doing lately that you just absolutely love? I don't know. I love it. I think it's really cool, and it's ChatGPT. I think yes, it is an amazing tool, and um, I can't even. I mean, it, it is a game changer, 
And it kind of reminds me, you know, when the web really came out, you know, like in pe some people were sending each other URLs because there wasn't real good search functionality. And they'd say, mm -hmm. oh, go to this website. And you had to type in the whole thing. And it was a game changer. I feel like this is that on steroids. And so I could not agree more. What that, are you using it for? It, it's like you are going to get left behind. You're, you, no matter what your job is, if you're not figuring out how to prompt the robot, you're going to get left behind. <clears throat> what are you using it for the most, do you think? Um, I, ideas. I, I, I use it in front of clients. I, I had a client, a CEO say, you know, I got to get in front of the, the group and do a motivational speech. And, you know, I, I really want to get them fired up. I go, well, let's see what the robot says. And we put in the name of the company and said, write a 500 word motivational speech, spit it out. We're at, we're at lunch in a restaurant. And he goes, oh, I wouldn't have to change much at all. And, and I've used it, you know, because I'm a big, big proponent of observable beha behaviors for core values. I mm. punched in companies' core values and said, give me three observable behaviors for this value. Boom, boom, boom. Mm. Most companies don't define the observable behavior for the value that they say is important. And again, yeah. if you don't have observable behaviors, how can you have clear expectations about what you want from other people? So I've used it for that. It's pretty cool. I love that. That's yeah. a good, that's a good one, Jan. See, I knew it. I was yeah, like, there you go. Yeah. Um, I actually, we're also having Dave Burris on next week or the following week. He just did a LinkedIn learning course all about how to optimize chat GPT. I'm like halfway through the course, but I agree. I'm totally nerding out on chat GPT. I think it's such a, I'm also very nice to it. Like oh. I say, please. And thank you because <laughs> you know, just in case I want them to remember, like Kim was always really nice. Well, I even, um, we're planning a really cool trip later this year. And I, I spent like an hour and a half, you know, somewhere I've never been. I was trying to find all this stuff. And I, and afterwards I said, huh. And I put a prompt into chat GPT and it spit out almost the exact same 20 day itinerary that I spent an hour and a half creating. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty amazing. That is wild. Um, yeah. Okay, when you wake up in the morning and you sort of open your email, what are some of the newsletters that you are subscribing to or new podcast episodes that you're yeah. getting notifications about? Just content that you regularly read or listen to that you find very valuable. Um, I like, the, you know, Dan Pink's been a frequent guest on our podcast. I like Dan Pink's stuff, his videos. He's, he's, he's a class act and he's always got, some cool insight. So, you know, I love Dan Pink. The, um, I've been subscribing to, I don't know if I'm getting the, this right, Chartable. It, it basically is a newsletter that's charts. And I think that's really cool because it's, you know, bite size and you can kind of analyze it and dig into it and kind of see trends. Um, but I, I scan a lot. I'm always, you know, I, I mean, I just consume you know, news and information and look for trends. And I'm, I find at least three times a day, I'm sending something to a client, you know, Hey, this, this is exactly what you and I were just talking about. So, yeah. I love that. Okay. Is there a certain app or software, maybe use it on your own, maybe use it with your client, but you just really find it valuable and it's something that you're kind of constantly, that's like your go-to that you use a lot. Well, I use, um, it, I, this isn't work related, but this is what came to mind. I have a Garmin watch and it, it's hooked up to Strava. So I'm a, I'm a cyclist. So every time I ride, I am competing <laughs> with me and everybody else that was on that ride. Um, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I'm super competitive. So I'm always comparing, you know, and I'm, I'm up the hill. Any, any ride I finish is 600 vertical feet to get back home. Um, so I'm always looking at, you know, how well did I get up the hill, you know, today? So. Strava. Well, I will offer you this. My husband is also very into Strava and he bikes here in Austin, which Austin is a big bike town. Yeah. We have lots of hills. It's very like bike friendly city. 
Um, he follows Lance, Lance Armstrong on Strava. And uh, that's also a good Strava follow if you bike. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, around here, here in Denver, we've got a lot of pro cyclists. And I always know if they're a pro because if I'm riding up the mountain and I hear um, a car coming and it's not a car, it's a cyclist <laughs> that sounds like a car. I'm like, OK, that he passed me because he's a pro. That's the only reason he passed me. <laughs> yeah, like, go on by. Yeah. You can go ahead. Yeah, but, oh, there's there's some su superhumans here. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, I, I get that. We'll be superhuman one day, Jan. Yeah, we just got to keep go. working towards it. <laughs> um, speaking of superhumans, are there certain humans, super or not, or accounts that you follow on the social interwebs, whether that's Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram, and maybe they're not even humans, maybe they're brands that you really love, or just their work inspires you, or just kind of every time you see them in your feed, you're like, Oh, yes. Like that's really valuable. Or that probably smile on my face. There's two with the same last name, but they're not related. Arthur oh. Brooks and David Brooks. Arthur oh. Brooks has a new book out called Strength to Strength. And David Brooks has a book out called The Second Mountain. And both these books are really about, you know, when you get to a certain point, when you've accomplished what you've wanted to accomplish, what do you do then? You know, what's next? And I think it's really interesting work because I work with a lot of veterans who are in transition and I don't work with a single person, no matter how accomplished, who's not in some sort of transition that, Hey, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm going. This is what I, I, this is how I want to be a better human. And I think that's really interesting. That whole pursuit, you know, it's kind of like Sisyphus, you know, we keep rolling the, the rock up the mountain, you know, every single day, you know, what makes us do that? And, um, you know, cause as, um, when we interviewed Simon Sinek, I remember him saying, you're never going to get there. You know, it's a journey. It's a journey. It's a journey. And I, I think there's good lessons in, in that, you know, that a good life isn't something a month from now or 10 years from now, or when I have this amount of money, I mean, I think we got to figure out a good life today. And um, again, I think that's tied to passion. And we spend a lot of time at work and um, gosh, you know, do what you love, you know, figure out a way sooner rather than later to, to, to find deep purpose and meaning in what you do. It's so true. And the faster you can do that, the better off you yeah. will be in the long run. Yep. Well, around here, we love homework. We love homework around these parts. So yeah. I'm curious if you could give us all a homework assignment to do maybe this week or this weekend, could be to read something, could be to do something, watch something, listen to something. I will put in a plug that I think everybody's homework should be to listen to one of the episodes of the Leadership Podcast. But I'm curious, what homework would you give everybody this week? What I, one of the first things I do with people I work with is I, I try to understand what they value, what they hold dear. Because if the values are not prioritized, they conflict. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, I, I always look at it as the five F's, you know, family, faith, fitness, finances, and fulfillment, you know, the work. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times those five things get really divided into two buckets, time and money. I want to spend, I want to do, do this stuff. I, I need to make $150,000. Um, I think if you, if you don't decide what your values are and put them in priority order, it's really hard to make little decisions or life decisions. And, you know, there's a link that I'll, I'll put in here. And I think we'll ask Shelby, because I don't think that goes, um, that goes to LinkedIn. Um, so if, if Shelby, we'll put if, it in if, there. Yeah, if you can put that link in the LinkedIn feed, um, that's a really good website to to kind of sort out what your your values are. And I would encourage you to try to get it down to three. And if Ooh. if you if you can get it down to three, and and you talk to the most important person in your life and say, hey, is this me? Um, I think you'll find that as you go forward in your endless transitions, it's a lot easier to, to make, you know, to take the right fork in the road. 
That is such a good homework assignment. And you even provided us a link, which makes it really easy to do the homework assignment. So that is in the chat. Or if you are listening to this on the podcast, we will include it in the show notes. But we love a good homework assignment, Jan. So yeah, thank you for that. Well, I, you know, I appreciate you. You really did your homework um, for this, <laughs> this, this today. I'm, I'm very, very impressed. Um, so thank you. Well, I was so looking forward to this. Where can people keep learning from you, following you, getting your nuggets of wisdom? Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn is, is a great place. And our, our website, if you want to see all the cool videos from our expeditions, it's at selfreliantleadership.com. But linked, if you go to LinkedIn, it'll take you to all the, the podcast, every, everything. And, um, you know, I put out about it. Uh, newsletter about once a month. And we have a podcast episode every single week with really interesting people. Um, but no, I appreciate it. Um, this was, this was really interesting. I appreciate it. I wish, you know, because I'm doing so much talking, I, I haven't been able to really read all the comments. Um, but I, I know people have been participating and I really appreciate that. And, and uh, if we didn't get to your questions, um, you know, feel free to ping me on social and I'll, I'll circle back with you. And it's a good point because we didn't get to all the questions because there were so many of them, but hopefully Jan will get the back. Maybe you'll write on LinkedIn the answer to the questions. Mm -hmm. I also feel like we are, Jeff has already been like, this is such a great tool. So we already have people that are taking action on the homework, which is right. so, deal. so great. Jan, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. It's an honor to be on the show, Cam. Thank you. And thank you everybody for coming to hang out. As always, we meet here every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern to learn from amazing leaders like Jan and also each other. So I'm so grateful for your time and your space and your energy and smarts that you brought to our conversation. I will see all of you in the coming weeks. This is going to be a really fun month for coffee chats, and I hope that you will join at getcoffeewithkim.com. Until next time, have an awesome week, everybody. Thanks so much.